Hey everyone, it's Mark from Flight Sim School and today we're going to be diving into the world of flight planning and preparation for a typical GA flight that you might do at either the TBM 850, the PC-12, the FSR 500, or any other similar plane that you might fly. We'll be planning an IFR journey from Charlotte over to Atlanta where we're going to look at how to prepare for the airport environment, how to choose the different procedures that we need for our flight plan, and a bunch of other things that you need to keep in mind as well. So make sure to stick around because this is going to be your go-to guide for planning a GA IFR flight. Before we get into all of the nitty gritty details, let's start by quickly just looking at all the different components that we're going to break down in this video. First off, with smaller airplanes, flights like this almost always start from a parking rather than a gate. And from there, we're normally going to taxi to a runway and takeoff is where things start to get interesting. For some airports, we're just going to take off and fly to the first waypoint that we filed in our flight plan. But other airports are going to have departure procedures or SIDS, which are there to help with standardizing the flow of traffic into and out of the airport. A departure procedure is really just a bunch of waypoints put together and once you reach the end of that procedure you can either go directly to your destination airport or you can add some en route waypoints if there's anything you want to avoid like bad weather, terrain or anything like that. As you get closer to your destination airport you might have to fly something called an arrival procedure or a star and that again helps to normalize the flow of traffic into the airport, although there are some restrictions that we need to look at a little bit later in the video when it comes to GA planes. At the end of the arrival procedure, you'll usually get some vectors to get to the approach, which is what's going to guide you down the rest of the way to the runway. And lastly, once we're back on the ground, we're going to taxi to our parking at the destination airport. Along the way, we also want to take into account the wind, the cloud coverage, precipitation, and terrain as well to make sure that we've planned for every eventuality. So let's start looking at how to do all of that. There are a bunch of different tools that you can use for flight planning from free resources like Skyvector, SimBrief, and Little Nav Map. But if you're looking for a one-stop shop for everything that we're going to look at today, it's really hard to beat Navigraph. I'm going to use it today to make things a little bit simpler for the video, but I realize a Navigraph subscription just doesn't fit in everybody's budget. So I'm also going to include some links to free resources which you can use as an alternative every single step of the way. And the concepts that we're going to look at to plan the flight are going to be the same regardless of the tool that you're using anyways. One thing you might be wondering about is if you can use SimBrief to plan a GA flight, and the answer to that is yes, but it's really optimized for airliners and the routes that they can fly, and there are some ways that you can tweak it to get a route for a GA plane, but it's really best to understand the concepts behind it anyways before you use it as a shortcut, so that's why we're going to do everything by hand today. The first task when you're planning your flight is to pick an origin and for GA flights you have a lot of flexibility for this because you don't need a very long runway. So I tend to stick to either municipal or regional airports, but on occasion if I'm flying a fast turboprop I'll also consider flying into or out of a large international airport. That's actually what we're going to do today and we're going to plan a flight from Charlotte International in the TBM 850. And for our destination, we're going to fly into Fulton Regional, which is a smaller regional airfield near Atlanta, and it'll give us a little bit of variety in terms of what we have to plan for. That's automatically pinned the airport diagrams for both our departure and our arrival right at the bottom. And the first thing that I'll usually do is open up our origin chart and have a look at where the general aviation parking area is so that I have an idea where to start in flight sim. The GA ramp's on the south side near runway 36 right, so once I'm at the point of going into flight sim, I'll try and pick a parking spot that's going to be near there so I can try and keep things as true to life as possible. The next thing to figure out is which runway to use for takeoff, and Navigraph makes this super easy because not only can you see the wind direction for each runway, but there's also a field right next to that that indicates if the runway is currently active or not. It's doing that by deciphering the ATIS report, which tells you a bunch of information about the airfield, including what runways are currently being used for departing and arriving aircraft. And you can see it yourself by just clicking on the departure icon, it'll bring you right to it. Or you can find it online as well very easily. 
If there's no ATIS at the field you're departing from, you're gonna have to make a judgment call based on the wind direction and speed. And again, this is super easy and you can see it right here what the wind's doing for each runway. That information comes from the METAR or the TAFE report for the airport, which again is very easily viewable by just clicking on any of the wind direction icons and it's easy to find online as well. Incidentally, I've done a deep dive in another video on how to read and interpret a METAR, so I'll link to that in the description for you if you want more details. As a last resort, if your airport doesn't have a weather report, you'll have to fall back to finding the windsock at the airfield once you've loaded it into the sim, which isn't ideal for flight planning purposes, but you can still make it work. For today, I'm going to pick 1-8 left since that's the closest to where I'm starting off from. And the last thing that I'll do on the airport reference chart is just familiarize myself with the taxiways from the parking area where I'm going to be starting the flight to the runway hold short line so that I have a rough idea where to go once we get moving. We're going to get back to the rest of the planning in just a second here, but I want to remind you if you haven't already to hit the like button if you learned something useful today and make sure to subscribe as well so you don't miss out on the next video. All right, so far we've got a straight line from Charlotte over to Fulton County, which in some cases is going to be a totally valid flight plan that you can use. But when you're flying out of bigger airports, you're normally going to use a departure procedure to get going towards your destination. The only thing to be aware of with flying instrument procedures in a GA plane is that a lot of them are only going to be valid for turbojets which basically means any airplane that doesn't have a propeller, so even turboprops won't be able to fly a lot of these procedures. The easiest way to tell if you can fly a given procedure or not is to open up the chart and in the notes section normally you'll see something like turbojets only in the conditions, which means that we can't use this procedure and we'll have to keep digging until we find one that we can. The Knight's 2 departure looks like it'll fit the bill because it's for propeller aircraft only, and although the chart does look fairly complex, there's a lot of information on here for other airports in the area other than Charlotte International, which we can completely ignore because we're not going to be using those. The inset at the top of the chart for Charlotte, though, gives us a really good idea of what to expect because it tells us what heading to fly for each runway after takeoff. And for some of them, it also tells us what altitude we need to climb to before we can turn away from that heading. What we do need to decide on this screen though is which transition we're going to use. Like I was saying earlier, a departure procedure is really just composed of a bunch of waypoints put together. And the last one is usually what's called a transition point because it transitions you from the departure procedure into the en route part of your flight. Which one you pick is going to depend on your direction of flight. In our case, we're going southwest towards Atlanta, so that leaves us with really only Nino or Debbie to choose from. And I'm going to pick the Nino transition, but really either one would work in this case. It's always a good idea to look over the entire chart before you exit out of it, just in case there's some important information hidden somewhere about the airport, the runway, or the departure procedure that you're flying. For example, here we've got a speed restriction that says that we need to use our best forward speed and climb rate on the departure so that we don't affect faster traffic around us too much. And there can be other things as well, like minimum and maximum altitudes as you go by different waypoints. The chart for the Knights 2 departure has been added to the pinboard at the bottom. So as we're progressing through the flight, it's always going to be easily accessible. And one feature that I like is to visualize it with the overlay view so that we can actually see how it fits in with the whole of the flight. So now we've got our departures sorted and you would think the next thing I would look at is actually the en route section. But what I actually do is pick my destination runway arrival and approach first because like that I'm going to have a better view of what I actually need for the en route section of the flight. For Fulton County, we don't have an ATIS report, so there's no information as to what the active runway is. So I'll have to base myself on what the winds are doing. And it looks like I'm going to use runway 26, even though there's a fairly strong crosswind there, because runway 14 doesn't have any instrument procedures, so I can't use it for an IFR flight. 
The other trick that you can do to have an idea what the active runway is, is to go onto Flight Radar 24 and see if there's any other traffic taking off or landing at that airport, or even looking at other airfields nearby to see what they're doing. Now we can pick our arrival procedure and again here we have to be careful because a lot of them won't be applicable to non-turbojet planes. But the DN3 is going to work for us since the only restriction on that one is that we're RNAV capable, which we are because we have a GPS on board today on our TBM850. Again, we're going to pick a transition, and this time it's the opposite of what we were doing before. We're going to go from the en route part of our flight and transition onto the arrival procedure. And there's really only one that makes sense for our flight today, which is the Milby Waypoint. Since all of those other transition points are a little bit too far north relative to our flight path, and the other thing is you don't absolutely need to use an arrival procedure. I'm using one here to show you how it works, but if there's only turbojet arrivals for the airport that you're flying into, what you'll usually do is fly right to the beginning of the approach instead. Speaking of approaches, the only choice we really have is the RNAV-226, so I'm going to pick that one. But if there was more than one approach available for this runway, I would pick the one that has the lowest minimum descent altitude, so the one that's going to bring me the lowest down to the ground, which will typically be an ILS approach. But if there's no ILS approach, the next most precise is pretty much always going to be the RNAV approach. And lastly, we have to pick the transition point for the approach. Once again, it's just a matter of looking at what makes the most sense for our route. And since we're coming in from the northeast, the CCAT transition could work, but it'll be a little bit funky because you can see it starts before the last waypoint of the arrival. So instead, I'm going to pick the final transition. And we can see once I do that, that our flight path is basically going to line up the same anyways. At this point, if we zoom out, we can see our full route from takeoff all the way to landing. And although I could put some waypoints between Nino and Milby for the en route section, I'm just going to leave it as a straight segment since it's a fairly short distance anyways. If I were flying a longer distance at cruise, what I could do is have a closer look at the low altitude IFR airways, which are there to help get you from place to place below 18,000 feet, and they can help you figure out which waypoints you should actually use for the en route part of your flight. For example, on this flight, if I really wanted to, I could jump on the V415 airway that runs just south of where we are by adding the Pelham waypoint right after Nino, which is the last waypoint of our departure procedure. And then that would take me all the way out to Milby, which was where we then jump onto the arrival and leave the airway. Now with the main part of the flight plan done, the next thing I focus on is figuring out what altitude I'm going to level off at and if I need to plan for any deviations from what I've originally planned. And that's going to depend on a few things like your airplane type for one, but also the terrain as well as a bunch of weather factors. There are a lot of different layers that you can enable within Navigraph and the first thing that I do once I've got my flight plan sorted is switch into the VFR map so that I can have a look at where there are elevation changes, how high those are and if they have any impact on my flight. And there's nothing major in this case today because we're staying just south of that mountain range so it's a non-factor but you're obviously going to want to pick an altitude that's going to keep you above any terrain for the flight plan that you're planning. Next, we can head into the weather overlays, and the way you navigate them is the same for all of them. So first, you've got to pick your weather layer that you're interested in. So let's say cloud coverage. And then next to that, you're going to have a timeline that you can either drag around to see what's going on at different times, or you can just press the play button to let it run through. The timeline is shown in UTC, so you have to convert it to the local time where you're planning the flight. And all the way over on the right hand side, there's another menu as well where you can pick what altitude it's showing you the information for. Since we're in a GA plane, I'm usually going to scroll around between flight levels 60 and 180 to get an idea of what's going on at those different altitudes. And even though we're doing an IFR flight, it is nice to not be stuck in clouds the whole journey. So I'll usually pick a cruise altitude that's at least a thousand feet above the first cloud layer, assuming that it's not too high up for the plane that I'm flying. 
If there's a lot of cloud coverage, it's worth checking out the radar page to see what's going on in case there are some strong storms that you need to avoid. Or on the other hand, maybe you're looking to fly into them if you want to make things extra spicy. Wind is next, and for this you'll need to learn how to read wind barbs. A short line on the barb represents 5 knots, a longer line represents 10 knots. So the more lines that you have, the stronger the wind is going to be. And once you have a triangle on the barb, you're looking at winds of over 50 knots. The wind direction is indicated depending on the direction of the barb. And once you understand that, you can have a look to see what altitude has the most favorable winds for your flight. You're looking for the altitude that's going to give you either the highest tailwind or the lowest headwind. So play around with the altitude filter until you find that sweet spot. The last thing to check on if you're flying around in wintertime is the icing conditions so that you have an idea of what to expect during your flight, especially if your airplane can't handle icing, that's kind of going to be a problem. Uh, but once you have all of that information, you can take it all into account to figure out what your cruise altitude should be. If you're flying a non-pressurized plane, you'll want to find an altitude somewhere below 10,000 feet that's going to optimize all of the conditions we just looked at. But if you're flying a faster plane that is pressurized, like a King Air, or a TBM, or a PC-12, you can definitely look into the high 100 and the low 200 flight levels. Once you've got your flight plan all buttoned up, you can export it from Navigraph into FlightSims format directly, but I don't actually use this feature because I prefer to enter all the details myself into the GPS. I've covered how to do that in detail in a previous video, so I'll link to it at the end of this one. And if you enjoyed watching this video, please make sure to leave a like and subscribe as well so you don't miss out on the next one.